This is the story of a massive global treasure hunt I created that took me over two years, touched six continents, involved thousands of players, a sunken ship, and just finished. So much happened that I never, ever could have predicted, but first I want to explain why I did it, and I'll start with how I got here. So, I got involved in the arts as a high school poetry kid in San Francisco. Girl, my big dish is just so pretty in this person. <laughs> During college, I performed hundreds of my spoken word shows at other campuses. Right after I graduated college, I had a viral video that changed the course of my life. And then I spent the next dozen years touring with my band, releasing music, and experimenting with video. And in 2017, I had an idea to do a series of records with interlocking album titles. I wanted the listener to think that they'd gotten a complete project, only to realize later that it had been the tip of the iceberg. So I worked with my friend, a very talented data scientist named Bernie Beckerman, to build an algorithm into whose constraints we fed the English dictionary. The algorithm spat out three words that instantly resonated with me. Complaint, placement, and intention. And at that moment, I made the decision that I would spend years exploring what those words meant to me in a series of pre-titled albums. I released Complaint in 2019 and toured the record, and I released Placement the following year, and was gearing up to tour it in a month you might remember, March 2020. So the Placement tour was canceled, and rebooked, and recanceled, and re-rebooked and re-recanceled and Omicron and Delta and when I was finally ready to tour again, I'd finished Intention and I really wanted to close this album cycle and era out with something special. And since the records themselves locked together as a puzzle, I gradually got this idea that I would make a real puzzle. That Intention wouldn't just be an album, Intention would be a game too. And this is the structure that I landed on. Nine physical items scattered around the world with nine different puzzle sequences to find each of them, culminating in a final reveal. I wanted the game to invite participants into the real world, but allow them to participate digitally as well. I wanted the game structured so it could only be solved as a group, and I wanted it to be free to play. I didn't make any money off of this game. In fact, it cost me a lot to make, but I felt like it was an opportunity to gift myself and in my small way, the world, some qualities that I felt like were in short supply in those years, like collaboration, cooperation, and fun for its own sake. And while there is a history of amazing treasure hunts and ARGs, some of which this game borrows inspiration from, I feel like this hunt is pretty unique and the opportunity to challenge the barrier between artist and audience on this level inspired me to go to some pretty extreme lengths. Now I wanna make a disclaimer here that might confuse some people who did not participate in the game, but one of my core beliefs is that global treasure hunts are simply more fun when they're hosted by mysterious entities and the official host of the Intention game is a velour tracksuit wearing fuckboy with a heart of gold from an alternate dimension named Tommy Designer. And if you were to look at a picture of Tommy Designer, you might think that looks a lot like me. And if you didn't know, you might even think it was me. But while I'm gonna be using a lot of words like I and me and seem to be taking a lot of credit for stuff later in this video, I just wanna put out there that we all know in our heart that it's Tommy Designer who's pulling all the strings. Got it? Good. There are a lot of places I could start explaining how the game functioned, but I wanna begin with what I hit around the world. This is a carved custom puzzle box that can only be opened by performing a series of hidden steps in a specific order. It was built by Barry. Barry does business as the Mediterranean carver on the island of Cyprus. I found Barry on Etsy and commissioned him to make nine of these spectacular boxes with my album titles carved into the lid, each with a different liner fabric color. 
which he shipped across the world to me. The most important thing that went into the box was a prism, 3D designed by my architect friend, Nick. I'd written a poem describing my interpretation of the three album titles, the poetic form of which is called a reverse nonet, a nine line poem in which each line has one more syllable than the one before it. I brought the steel prisms and my poem to an industrial engraver who etched one line of the poem on top of each prism. That poetry line served as the code that proved solvers had found the box and then unlocked the next part of the game. The prisms went into the boxes, along with gift certificates to local businesses, some other goodies, an AirPod tracker, and a note to anyone who might discover the box accidentally. I double shrink wrapped the boxes in heavy duty plastic and duct taped them super tight. That leaves the most important element of a puzzle hunt, the puzzles. But because some of our puzzles were gonna solve to precise lat long coordinates, we couldn't actually build the puzzles out until we knew exactly where the boxes were gonna go. And because I'd picked some very ambitious hiding spots, some of which I'd only get one shot at, I really didn't know for a lot of them if I'd succeed. And so before we talk about puzzle design, let's talk about where I tried to hide the boxes. A Nelder plot is a grouping of trees planted in concentric rings by biologists in order to research its growth patterns. There are a few of these pine tree crop circles around the world, and one of them happens to be in Northern California, near where I'm from. I found that cluster in Google Satellite View back in April 2022 to scout it as a possible box location. My dad and I drove a few hours into the Sierra Nevada mountains with my GPS coordinates and walked into the woods. Where are we now? Where are we now? We're in an elder plot. A Nelder plot exemplifies my dream qualities in a treasure hunt hiding place. It's cool. I might learn something new by going there. I have some personal connection to the location. It's on public land. It won't fuck with locals. People who are looking for it can find it, and people who aren't are unlikely to. Danger level, maximum, medium. No war zones. I did a lot between my scouting mission and the following winter. Designed the outline of the game, hired key collaborators, fabricated the boxes and prisms and targeted dream locations. Now it was time to try to sneak them into the real world, into places that they might have to live for a really long time. A few days before my only window to go back to the Nelder plot, I got my first curveball. Mountain snow and gusty winds. Tonight, a powerful multi-day storm is bringing more misery. Closing Interstate 80. This has been the worst winter I've been through. 58 feet, an all-time record. Um, I'm at the roadway in. This drive took me like 12 damn hours because of snowstorms and ice storms. My plan is to go do this around dawn. And I went to look on the map to drop my pin. The map couldn't complete my directions, so I zoomed in and I saw that there, there was the squiggly red line for a closed road. I think that it's just near enough to where the road's still open that if I drive up to where the closure starts, I can walk my way in. This is the start of my, my Darwin award-winning video. What are you used to be for? No. So these are real easy to use. Just slip your foot in here. Moment of truth. Let's do it. Oh, first time on snowshoes. I at the snowshoe place said that it's the deepest he's seen it in 20 years. You can hear everything. Here's our guy. Oh, nine, tree nine. Almost swallowed up by the snow. It's like the perfect Looney Tunes style booby trap. I try to get this tree off and then dig all this fucking snow out. About an hour to nightfall, so gotta get moving. There it is, in a hole in the ground. Made it to the road. I got so much confidence from getting a box in the ground. It made me feel like this can work. And that brings me to the big trip I took because last winter I booked a round the world flight itinerary with a very thin margin for error where I hoped to bury seven of the nine boxes. I was joined on my first two stops by my friend Mike Squires and our first location was our riskiest one. This might be like the craziest reason why I've traveled anywhere. 
pretty weird. <laughs> like I can sleep after Christmas. <laughs> we took a ferry. We're basically coming to Vimini and then leaving pretty much immediately. We're gonna try. And we hopped the speedboat. The SS Epona ran aground in the Bimini Islands just inside the Bermuda Triangle in 1926. Its concrete skeleton still sits half above water and half below, and while it is quite difficult to get to, it is not impossible. And when I learned about the Epona, I was determined to try. Mike and I snorkeled into the ship. Let's get to it, because we have a little opportunity here right now. He hoisted me onto a beam, and I hid the prism on a ledge. And we're out. And we took a ferry back to Fort Lauderdale. Further up the path. This prism was the only one separated from its box. I had looked into underwater containers, but decided there just wasn't a great way to hide a big wooden box in the Sapona. So we buried the box near the ferry station with instructions on how to continue to the prism and a stack of cash to pay for that trip. Next up, Mike and I hopped a flight to JFK where we landed at night, rented a car, and drove out to the historic Smith Covered Bridge in Delaware near where my mom's side of the family is from. How are you feeling, George? Nervous. We just need to find a good spot. A good spot by the bridge. Because imagine any of those cars passing us, dude. Yeah, we're toast. They came from behind us. <laughs> Yo, wait, they're not gone yet. It was so cold that night that on the way, we bought a propane tank and a torch at Lowe's in case we needed to thaw the ground out. That hole's looking pretty promising, George. I think it's getting close. I think you're there, dude. Uh, oh, GPS. That was the last thing. Oh my god, dude. Yo, talk to me, George. How you feeling? What happened? I mean, I'm, I'm really stoked, but I can't feel my toes. Just oh. fucking six degrees. Are you kidding me? After we buried that box, I drove through the night to drop Mike off at home in Connecticut, and then I continued alone back to JFK and got on a Christmas morning flight to London. I drove from Heathrow to Cornwall on Christmas Day and stopped at my friend Andrew Briggs and his family's house for a lovely Christmas dinner. And in the middle of Christmas night, I buried the English box. Three in the morning in the town square of Zenor, uh, on Boxing Day, the day after Christmas. I drove back through the night and hopped on a flight from Heathrow to Doha to Windhoek, Namibia, and rented another car. I drove stick in England, because I'm uh, doing it again. And then I started my 400-mile drive from the capital to near Luteritz, one of the locations where I'd shot some of my placement music videos with my filmmaker friends Mike and Jess back in 2019. Gotta make it look easy. sunrise here in a very remote part of Namibia. Um, here's where the prism is. It's under this rock, right at this sign, right across from this rest area. It's 6 a.m. on the dot. I'm fucking exhausted. Um, pretty chewed up from just basically using my hands to pull rocks out of the soil and make a hole in this very... Is that the inside or outside? God damn it. Yes. Haha. -ha. I don't think it's because I'm stinky and they want to sting me. But I am stinky. 
I am tired and I am glad I got this box in the ground. Uh, every time I bury one, I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, it's all the easy ones ahead from here. But it's just, um, it's a really, really cool trip. I'm realizing that this is something that I'll never do again quite in this way. And just grateful to see the world. I mean, it's just crazy to move this fast. And, and the fact that it's working is just mind boggling. So really glad that, um, that I'm doing this. And I've got to say, Namibia is just an incredible place. It's stunning and the people are kind and welcoming. After 36 hours in Namibia, it was on to Mumbai, where I've got some good friends, played twice with my band, and is one of my favorite cities in the world. I'd originally planned to hide the box in a forest inside the city called the R.A. Milk Colony, but after checking it out and learning more about the area's political unrest, I decided that it wasn't a respectful or appropriate hiding place. But fortunately, my friend Tage introduced me to the curators of a contemporary Indian art gallery called the Method Gallery, who graciously let me leave the box there. just finished hiding the box in Mumbai. Oh, I also celebrated New Year's in Mumbai and it was fucking awesome. Happy New Year 23, oh, baby. Fine. Bombay is your second home and I'm right here to host you. Johnny Kapoor. I had a super intense travel leg from Mumbai to Western Australia, and it wasn't a coincidence that I picked Perth, which gives me an opportunity to talk about one of the other really important aspects of how this puzzle hunt functioned, and that is web design. Back when I had a high school hip hop jazz band named Invisible Ink, my bandmate friend Daniel got a cold email one day out of the blue from a guy named Paul Bui in Perth, Australia, who offered to make us a website for free and ever since then, Paul has been a good friend of mine and one of my go-to web developers, and this treasure hunt gave me a great excuse to visit Paul and Eddie Pitlawani, who built an amazing website for this treasure hunt that served as our hub for rolling out clues and submitting solves, had some really impressive functions, and required some masterful back-end programming. This was my third secret website, and one of them involved traveling through a wormhole in my butt into an alternate dimension, so you know the tight back-end is very important to me. I spent a lovely afternoon with Paul and Eddie in Perth designing a lockbox that we hid under the floorboards of the iconic Moon Cafe. Are you, uh, are you jaded on this? Afterwards, we relaxed at the beach, but it was short and sweet because I had to turn around and head right back to the airport for my longest journey yet to my last remaining continent. And as remote as some of these locations so far were, the Salar de Uyuni, a massive salt flat in Bolivia, which during the rainy season serves as the world's biggest mirror, beats them all. It took me six flights to get there. Perth to Sydney, Sydney to LA, LA to Miami, Miami to Santa Cruz, Bolivia, Santa Cruz to Cochabamba, Cochabamba to Uyuni, and then a drive out to the Salt Flats. On the way to Uyuni, I met up with Mike and Jess, my friends from the Namibia trip, to film at the location. So I think you'll probably agree with me that our hiding spots were pretty epic, and I felt like if the game was gonna be this elaborate in its scope, that the quality of our puzzles needed to justify that grandeur. 
So allow me to introduce the game's other most important collaborator. My name's Sandy Weiss. I live in Chicago. In terms of people who specialize in exactly what I do, I think very, very few. I own and run The Mystery League, a company that I started about nine years ago. Anything that involves puzzles, I'm happy to do it. You know, I like mechanics that have to do with wordplay. But from an experiential perspective, I like to build puzzles that are layered into their environment. Even though a lot of my puzzles are layered, complex, and difficult, I do pride myself on making them elegant, which is to say when you're done with them, you can look back and see, well, the jumps that you had to make were fair. I do feel like solving puzzles like these is way more fruitful, but also satisfying when you do it in a group. You know, if you run a business, mysteryleague.com can tell you about that stuff. But I also have a newsletter, and that's at signals.fun. Social media stuff, you can find me on Instagram. What's the handle? Mystery League. Um, oh boy. When I got back from Bolivia, covered in salt and mud, there was one box left to hide. And I did not hide that box alone. We are the dream makers. Yeah, let's go. We hid the box near the remote mine shaft where in 1910, the forester Ed Pulaski sheltered with 45 rangers. Boys, it's no use. We've got to dig out of here. We've got to try and make wallets. That's our only chance. During one of the biggest wildfires in American history, Careful for your snowshoe. The Great Fire of 1910. I'm gonna go down there. All right, the mine. Do the honors. It's in a hole. 47.44844. Big moment. Last box is in the ground. Thank you so much, Sandy. We're on our way back. Up at 5.30 to uh, leave Spokane. The Ramada by Wyndham. Now we knew the box locations down to six latitude, longitude, decimal places, and it was time to finish the puzzles that would lead the game players there. I learned that it is incredibly hard to find the fine line between making a puzzle impossible and making it difficult enough so that the hive mind, which is incredibly powerful, won't solve it immediately. So these puzzles are complex, and if you want a detailed explanation of how each of them worked, you can visit the link in the description below. But for now, here's a summary of how each of the puzzles functioned. So for thread number one, we sent solvers to Mumbai. Solvers received postcards that they had to pool information from. The information solved cryptically to several nine-letter words that each contained a cardinal and a semi-cardinal direction. With those letters, you could map the word onto a compass rose, which has eight spots. By doing that and applying one more clue in the form of a direction that was from another group of postcards, it revealed which letter had to be extracted. Those extracted letters formed three words, which led solvers to a what three words location. What three words is an awesome online service that divides the globe into a fine grid and associates three unique words with each square and only that square on the planet. So it's a great tool that allows you to take a word puzzle answer and translate it directly to a geolocation. Sandy, along with his fellow mystery leaguers, Pascal Boonstra, Lucy Myers, and Hannah Wilson, designed the meat of the majority of these puzzles. But I did have my Ringo Starr contributions to the album, my yellow submarines, my octopuses gardens, if you will, and those were the 10th meta puzzle that I'll describe at the end of this video and the next two threads that I'll get into here. So for Zenor UK, we fabricated three custom jigsaw puzzles, which I distributed one piece at a time at my concert tour. When assembled in online community, the fronts of those puzzles revealed what town the box was in and the backs of the puzzles revealed riddle poems. The riddles solved to which number sequence you should use to pull particular letters out of the poem, which then solved to final instructions on where to dig. Perth was solved through a marathon livestream I ran while creating my illustrated album companion piece. 
I clued crossword answers visually in the illustrations. That crossword grid was then applied to another series of visual clues, which led to a what three words location. Solvers also needed to find the code to the lockbox we hid, and to get that, they had to identify timestamps of when my band played riffs from the song Round Ball Rock during our concert tour's live album. Sing it if you know it, let's go! You still got no understanding. For the next thread, it's important to know about spectrograms, which are visual representations of audio waveforms. Thread four was to Namibia. We had pieces of a QR code in the spectrograms of a live performance from Watsky's tour. That led to a domain, hoodwink.fm, which when the player started showed visual static and played audio static. But by inspecting the black pixels, some of them turned out to not be black or white, but were something else. Those outlier pixels resolved to the shape of a well-known constellation. And one of those pixels was highlighted. By identifying that highlighted star, typing in the right URL, the audio static changed to music. The music needed to be identified, which led players to a episode of epic rap battles. Those episodes, when taken together, yield the latitude and longitude of where the box was hidden in Namibia. For Thread 5, we used a Tumblr account for Tommy Designer to clue Google Street View locations, and then also provide a series of itineraries. But those instructions, there were 54 of them, were all mixed up. So they had to use deductive reasoning to sort out which instructions went together and make nine complete sensible itineraries. By following those itineraries to new locations and then using those locations to form triangles and then finding those triangles orthocenters, which is the intersection of the three altitudes, which was a clue we gave them, it led solvers to three new locations. Those locations led to a final latitude longitude point, which was right next to the Smith covered bridge in Delaware. Thread six was to the Sierra, California. Solvers pooled information that they got from hundreds of postcards. That information led them to specific FedEx stores around the country where they picked up four different printouts of pictures. When overlaid, these images revealed a spoke pattern that clued a Nelder plot. When each set of four items on a given spoke was analyzed together, it became apparent that they all shared one letter in common. Those letters in order spelled the answer and where exactly to dig, that phrase was Sierra, Lois, Row 9, Tree 9. And because Nelder plots are dog tagged, each tree with a specific numbered spoke and ring, we were able to lead solvers to our exact tree. For thread seven, we, we built four phone trees, those numbered options that you sometimes get on an answering machine or voicemail service, which when called greeted callers with a labyrinthian tree, each of which worked differently. One required knowledge of Watsky lyrics, one required knowing track lists from famous albums, one required understanding references to famous sets of 10 or more items, and one required referencing what happened specifically in parts of Watsky music videos. All of those things were clued in cryptic ways. Some people simply have it. Press one. I gotta be a man of my word. Press two. Can we just quit each other the way you did cigarettes? Press one. By putting together the tree's correct answers, one, one layer at a time, it led you to a secret video of Tommy Designer speaking enigmatically. Sincerely, me, Tommy D, a flea upon a flea. Clues in that script paired with items from the trees led you to a latitude longitude, which led you to Bolivia. Thread9 sent people to Florida and then the Bahamas. We sent postcards. Solvers pooled information from the postcards, which solved to lines from novels with one word change. Which converted to a frequency on the FM dial. Then any player who got a postcard had to identify the call letters of a radio station at that frequency in their city. Those call signs, when decoded using the same cryptogram, yielded common four-letter words, which could be made into five-letter words matching the title from the book from which the lines were extracted. Those extra letters yielded the final phrase, which was a what three words location. Um, cool, great. Any final uh, words to the people? I uh, appreciate uh, you guys letting me in on the Discord and I saw every one of your Sandy jokes and I appreciated them, so thank you. All right, well, thank you, Sandy. You bet. Have a good day. All right. You too. Bye. See ya. So here we are, the boxes are hidden, the puzzles are designed, the first half of my record has just come out, the second half of which is grayed out and unplayable, and when people listen to my record for the first time and arrive at the final line, they hear... <laughs> Triple X.
which is the URL that kicks off the puzzle. Because I'd already built secret websites clued in the same way, I think a lot of my listeners know that when I mention a URL, there's probably something there. And so over 2,000 people joined the Discord that night to start working on the puzzle. And that's when the coolest part of this experience started for me, watching the solvers take over the game. Deep, he says. Not that deep, he says. Not that deep, he says. Oh my god! There it is! Let's go! <laughs> Underneath the bridge, go <laughs> No, we don't want room! Why? <laughs> hey! Alright! 500 dollars sounds like someone's snorkeling. How long have you guys been waiting for someone to come and get this for? <laughs> Unbelievable. Now that's a sexy Oh box. my god. Jesus. We've just spent the last four days acclimating to the altitude. We just met up with our local expert and guide, Fernando. We are beginning our 10 hour long drive across Bolivia. Take us, Fernando. Legend. After scouring this entire place. I found it. I fucking found it. <laughs> it's completely warped, full of cement like mud, but it's here. It's It took the group a couple extra days to solve the ninth prism code because apparently a year underground in the rainy salt flats had melted my plastic and corroded the prism. Uh, so I spent those days scrambling for a backup plan, but somehow the Bolivia crew actually managed to de-rust the prism and solve the ninth triangle. My puzzle still had one more step, but something else had also happened during the solver's searches. I am the first piece of Y'all doing a puzzle for me? me? Ooh, that's kind of crazy. Oh. I love that. Can you hold up one second? Of course. I'll be right there. All right. You see, right after the second box was found in Delaware, I was finally leaving on the tour that had taken me four years to get off the ground. And while I was meeting some supporters at my first tour stop in Vancouver, someone handed me a single jigsaw puzzle piece. Not only had the folks working on my game designed a reverse puzzle for me to solve, but in an insane moment of parallel thinking, we were both handing each other single jigsaw puzzle pieces with one letter on the back that would have to be assembled later and decoded. And every show until my final gig in New Zealand, I'd hand someone one of my jigsaw puzzle pieces and someone would return the favor. Completing their jigsaw led me to a URL with more puzzles, which ultimately solved to the same snowshoe rental place I'd visited a year earlier. So my parents and I made a weekend of it. We drove up into the mountains and at the rental place, I picked up an elaborate triangular box that the solvers had built. And after opening, yes, more puzzles to solve the box's three locks, I found that it was full of thoughtful tokens, an album they'd collaborated on, and a certificate to a crater that they had officially named after me on the moon. This was exactly what I dreamed of happening with this treasure hunt, which is something that I never could have dreamed of happening. After I'd solved the solver's puzzle and they'd found my prism in Bolivia, the group spent a climactic night in the Discord spamming the ninth code 9,999 times to unlock a video game and claim their prize.
really liked the idea of sending people to six continents at unbelievable effort only to reward them with history's most elaborate Rickroll, but the Ninth Prism actually unlocked two other reveals as well. The final piece of the Intention album, which was a secret mixtape called Tommy Designer's Golden Fleece, and the reveal that the locations of each box formed pins that traced an arrow pointing at the last place I'd played a concert and the only first time concert stop on that tour my intersection of intentions firsts and lasts, New Zealand. The next day, I rolled out clues for one final puzzle that unified the hunt's themes, and my friend Nick, who helped me design the 3D prism, helped me construct a chess game that when played to checkmate on top of the riddle grid, clued the solver's 10th and final location. And very recently, a seeker took a ferry from the North Island to the South and drove the entire length of the country down to the town of Teana, where he and his partner received massages courtesy of Tommy Designer and the 10th and final box, a double reverse Uno for the game the solvers had played on me. I revealed myself in the Discord and told the solvers that the game was over, that they'd done it and all that was left was the back rub. And I knew they'd be happy on a level, but I also suspected that some of them would be sad because they had worked in intense collaboration for a year, and I thought it was probably gonna feel a little bit like the end of summer camp. It wasn't a coincidence that the first thing I asked players of this game to do was ask themselves why they decided to play it and what they hoped to get out of it. Because there are a lot of ways to win something, and also because that's the question I continually ask myself. What is a life well lived? Why do we do what we do? And to that point, the game has one final point. Watsky's been my stage name for many years. It's also my real last name, but it's also a persona that in some ways has acted as a shield that has allowed me to seize a confidence that I didn't always feel like came naturally to me. So I thought there could be no better way to graduate from one phase of my life into the next than by giving the people who made the Watsky era possible the agency in releasing me from it. Uh, you can still call me Watsky if you want, it is my name after all, but from now on, you can also call me George. I am ready for my next adventure. If you want a way to support my work, there's a link to a Patreon I started in the description. I'm not planning on being super active on it, but it's there if you want a way to directly support my work, but I'm grateful for you no matter what. Thank you and congratulations. Office. I got tongue twisted. What?